All right. Good morning. I hope everyone's having a great conference. My name's Kyle Gupton. I'm a director of product development at Tableau, leading teams that work on many of the kind of nitty gritty, behind the scenes, critical internals of our products. So today, I'm happy to introduce our speaker, Tableau Zen master, Ryan Sleeper. When Ryan isn't blowing us away with his Tableau public visits, he's an independent Tableau consultant, author, blogger, speaker, and educator. A good place to go to increase your knowledge of Tableau is Ryan's website, ryansleeper.com. He's also the author of a fantastic book called Practical Tableau, which will be released by O'Reilly Media in late November. Ryan, congratulations on that achievement. If you happen to know Ryan's work on Tableau Public, which, by the way, earned him Viz of the Year Award in 2015, you know he's in the sports, really in the sports. And not only the actual sporting part, but also the economics as well. So I'm excited to see some of those examples today. Sports business is a long-standing passion for Ryan. He's a graduate of the University of Central Florida MBA and Master of Sport Business Management programs. From his time in university in Orlando, Ryan still roots for the magic, but other than that, he's all Kansas City the Chiefs, the Royals, and Sporting KC. Now, is it only about sports? His wife and he are really into travel, and of course, there's a viz for that. Ryan's been using Tableau for almost eight years, starting in 2010. He admits it took him a little while to get the product, but those days are long behind him. In fact, Ryan is the only person in the world to earn Tableau Zen Master, Iron Viz Champion, and Tableau Public Viz of the Year so he knows a thing or two about visualizing data. Today, Ryan will share his approach to data visualization, taking us through his process for discovering and sharing valuable insights in data using Tableau. Please join me in welcoming Ryan Sleeper. Good luck. All right, hey everybody, good morning. And uh, thanks for the intro, Kyle. I really, that was awesome. Although I think next year I might need to get some of that Taylor Swift I overheard from next door, just to add a little bit more to it. But first I just want to thank all of you for being here. You know, I, I have to admit after the, the shooting last weekend, it, some of this feels a little inconsequential to me, especially the stuff that I have to share, but being here has really been a reminder, really enjoyed the last couple of days, and it's just been a reminder of how grateful I am to hang out with everybody, and uh, it's been awesome. So. Uh, that being said, yeah, thank you for being in Vegas. Thank you for your time. I know there's a lot of great sessions to choose from. And now I'm going to hopefully share some things and have a little bit of fun with this. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet, again, my name is Ryan Sleeper. I share a weekly tutorial, some type of either data viz, Tableau tutorial, strategy, et cetera, at ryansleeper.com if you want to check it out. And if you're on Twitter, uh, my, my name is Ryan Vizes. Kyle mentioned these, but I'll just go a little bit further on just a couple of them. Practical Tableau is out in digital form already. It's 100 different tutorials. The, the subtitle is 100 different tips, tutorials, and strategies from a Tableau Zen Master. And 71 of those chapters are already available at O'Reilly's website, Safari Books Online, if you're interested in checking it out. And then Zen Master, I, I'm always curious, how many of you even know what that means by show of hands? That's pretty good. I guess I'm, this is a little more preaching to the choir than I'm used to. This is my first year with Zen Master. What I've realized is most people have no idea what that is. They just think I made up some weird, arrogant name, like a ninja or guru. So it's good. A couple of you know what that is. But uh, that's kind of the highest certification. It's not actually a test or anything, but there's 27 of us. And there's also a Zen's in the community thing you could check out if you want to talk more uh, personally. It's in the expo hall towards the end of it. So Kyle mentioned some of these. I won't go into depth. On, on them all, but he mentioned I'm the only person in the world to have all three Tableau Zen Master, Tableau Public Visit of the Year, and Iron Viz Champion. But the reason that I like to share that, those credentials, is that it leads into my two favorite slides that I present every time I do any type of training or presentation, and that is that regardless of all those credentials, my learning curve looks something like this, where that long flat line represents about two years of really struggling with Tableau. It took me a long time, as Kyle mentioned, to kind of get it. And so I try to provide some purpose behind all of my presentations, and my objective going into these types of talks is that I'm hoping by attending conferences like this, attending training, seeing sessions like this, that your learning curve is a lot faster than mine was. My agenda today, kind of the umbrella of what I do, I kind of coined the term tab blueprints. It's a play on the word blueprint, kind of 
my approach to data visualization in general, but there's a lot that goes in underneath that. And the one that I'm gonna share with you today I call the Triple Crown Framework. This is a, str a strategic framework, kind of a set of principles that I follow and just have in the back of my mind whenever I'm designing and doing anything in Tableau. So I'm gonna share that with you today. It's my newest one. I, I just came up with it in, in the spring of this year. So I'll share that. Towards the end, I'll get a little bit more tactical and show you at least, we're gonna hop over to Tableau, I'm gonna show you at least one kind of easy to do, but not in show me op uh, option for a, for a chart type. I'm hoping to give you at least one cool trick you can take back to the office. And then if there's time at the end, I'll hang out and take questions and then attempt to answer them. But to start, I always like to share a metaphor for data visualization, and that's the IronViz Championship. Has anybody been in this room to the IronViz Championship? So about the same, all right. Uh, this is a cool event, and it's later today. I think it's at 4.45. If you've never seen it, you have to try to go to this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of Tableau Super Bowl. It's their big, biggest data visualization contest. There's three finalists each year. And it always fascinates me, because they've done this for six years, and every year there's three finalists, and all three of them come up with something completely different. So they've had 18 just totally different results through this contest. So that piece of it fascinates me. But I also view it as kind of a metaphor for data visualization and how I approach data visualization. And I'll explain that in a moment. Just, but just to give you a little bit of context, if you haven't been there, I want to share some actual photos from the IronVis Championship. This is the year that I competed, which was 2013. I have to admit, these are starting to feel like photos from the 70s or something. They look very old. And these are, the contest gets bigger and bigger every year. It's just insane to me. A couple years ago, last time we were in Vegas, it was in the MGM Grand Arena. Uh, it'll be even bigger this year, it's just insane. But they make it a show, again, this is their main data viz competition. There's only, th only one way to get into it, to be a, one of the three finalists, and that is to win one of three Tableau public feeder contests that are held throughout the year. So everybody up there is very, very good at Tableau, but Tableau also makes it a show. So this is some actual photos. They turn down the lights, there's, uh, there's got laser lights, a fog machine, they even make you wear a chef's jacket because it's a play on the Iron Chef television show. So it's, it's very much a show. Uh, here's the three finalists competing up there on the stage. And these screens are much bigger now, but you've got a huge screen behind you. Everybody's kind of watching your every move. So there's definitely a element of show to it. And this is what I think of when I think of data visualization. There, if you think of the steak and sizzle analogy, which most of you probably know, you can't have data visualization without the data, right? That's the substance of, you just have to have that. But at the same time, I firmly believe that if you don't balance in some sizzle or some design and showmanship, you can't be as successful with data visualization as possible. And that was kind of the genesis for my latest framework, which I call the Triple Crown Framework. And these are the three pillars, and I'm gonna go in depth on each one of these three, but it starts with data. As I just mentioned, you can't have data visualization without data. Everybody knows this piece of it, or knows that you need that piece of it. The second pillar is design. And it's been very interesting for me personally to see the evolution of the design aspect of this. When I started with Tableau about eight years ago, I would say this was very underappreciated. Most executives, I've always been on the, on the consulting side, so I see a lot of different industries and how they're using Tableau and looking at data visualization. And there was a, I would say design was very underappreciated. Not many people were using it. I'd say today, where we stand, we're probably at about 50-50. People are, are getting it. We're definitely heading in the right direction. They know that it's not enough just to have data, a big, huge spreadsheet. We need to make this engaging somehow so people want to use it, adopt it, and something happens because of it. And I'd say we're about 50-50. I think most of us in the room are, are probably there. But the genesis of the third pillar was, I, you know, I always think about that Iron Viz Championship as my metaphor. And there was still some third, there's something missing for me, a, a third piece of this that really put, you know, all the finalists are always very, very good at Tableau and, and most of them are very good at design. But there was something extra that, there has to be something extra to kind of push them over the top. And I thought about this for a couple years and what I kept coming back to was this idea of psychology. You know, all the, all the contestants that won somehow either had a strategy in place or connected with the audience, communicated their data visualization in some way that kind of put them over the edge. And after finally realizing that it was psychology as that missing piece, I realized that it actually probably goes in this order. Psychology, even though it was the last thing that I thought of, it's probably the most important aspect of data visualization, believe it or not. If you're skeptical of that, I'm gonna segue into 
uh, I'm going to give you a few tips on each one of these, and starting with psychology. So first thing to consider if you're skeptical of this idea, because when it hit me, I realized, you know, you never think about it, but it really is a critical component. Consider the following question, who is your audience when you design a data visualization? For me, this is always the first question I ask, and it has nothing to do with data, design, Tableau, really. It's, it's uh, you know, much less tangible. It's, I need to figure out how to connect with my audience if they're actually going to use it. And here's just a few examples of what I'm thinking about. So here's, here's a few different audiences that you may be designing for. First is the CEO. If I went into a Tableau project, I need to design something for a CEO. These people are most likely not a desktop user. They're not going to really want to interact a lot with parameters or filters. You need to boil up the answer or the insight on what happened and, and hopefully what to do about it. Kind of just the facts, CEO level. A completely different audience would be a coworker, that, especially if it's a fellow analyst or consultant that knows how to use Tableau Desktop. I might be building something very different for them. Maybe it's a self-service tool of some type. They'll know how to interact with it, so I can build in some of that flexibility and interactivity. The, the two products I would create between those two are very different. So I try to answer this question of who's going to be looking at this before I even start investing my time in Tableau. Third audience would be mainstream. I'm a big Tableau public user, a big sports guy. This is a completely separate audience. I mean, I don't want to stereotype, but a lot of the people looking at my visits aren't data people, and I need to communicate the insight in a way that is easy to understand, so they're excited about it, want to share it, that kind of thing. That's a totally different, a third different product. And the last audience I have to share is your mom. And I don't mean any offense by this. Sometimes I get in trouble uh, presenting this one. But Truly, I, I, this is kind of some of my secret sauce that I'm sharing here, but if I ever have a viz about sports that I want to share with somebody that knows absolutely nothing about sports, I share it with my mom and say, hey, does this make sense? What are you seeing? Are you seeing the main story? Of course, this could be dad, brother, whoever, but my mom happens to, it pains me how little she knows about sports, but it's been a good barometer test for a lot of my sports visits. The third, or the second tip within the psychology section, I'm going to discuss. It's, it's a little more specific to, to the world of psychology, and that's psychological schemas. Schemas, and this is not to be confused with database schemas, which we all probably have heard of. Long before that, in, on the, in the science world, there was something called psychological schemas. And in a nutshell, the example I like to share to help us wrap our heads around this is: schemas are patterns that we build up our entire lives. They kind of help standardized experiences. We, we learn and we can fit things into different schemas. So just let me give you one example, if I'm rambling and not making too much sense yet. But I like to think of when you go to a restaurant, you have a preconceived notion of how things are going to go. You're going to park your car, walk inside, be greeted by the host or hostess. They're going to sit you down. Waiter's going to come by, take your drink order, leave for a little while, bring your drinks back. You guys know the rest of it. It's the same thing every time. You can go to basically any restaurant in this country, and even though you've never been there, you're going to know how to proceed. That can be an example of a schema among millions and millions of them. You know, if you walked into that restaurant and the server shows up and says, here's your bill, you'd be very confused. That would disrupt your schema. It would throw off your pattern of how you expect things to go. And I argue that that same principle can be applied to data visualization in two ways. It can either help you, you can help your end user process what you're trying to share, or if there's a disruption to their schema, it gives them a starting point for an analysis. And I'm going to share an example to try to help make this, kind of bring this to life a little bit. But what we're looking at here is a bar chart that shows the lowest price per section during Super Bowl 50. So this is two years ago in Santa Clara, California. It's a perfectly fine visual. It, a lot of people will consider this best practice. It's, it's sorted so I can quickly see and compare the lengths of the bars and know right away. However, to me, it has one shortcoming, which is you kind of have to know the names of the, the sections in that stadium. So I took a shot at leveraging schemas to help my end user process this visual more efficiently. And so I took the same exact data and put it on a map of Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. And the result looked like this. And because I've attended dozens of sporting events over my lifetime, I had, a, even though I don't know the names of the sections in that particular building, I've never been there, but I can process this much more efficiently now. I can see, I would expect, as I get closer to midfield, lower, lower rows, it's going to be more expensive. As I get up into the higher sections, towards the corners, further from midfield, they're going to be less expensive. That's a schema. 
It helped me process that more efficiently without even needing to know the, the section names. So that's the first way you can use these, to help your end user process it more efficiently. The other way is if there was a disruption to the schema. That would help me really kind of highlight what I'm trying to share. So if I were to share this view and the viz showed that there was a red section in the upper, upper corner there, that would very much disrupt my schema. It would give me a starting point for an analysis. Something different was happening in that section. Either it's maybe they were doing all you can drink, all you can eat up there. Maybe it's go down to the field after the game. Something different would be happening there. So that would be the other side of providing a disruption to that expectation to help my end user uh, know what to do next. What's that? Oh, those are, those are sweets. Yep. And, in the, and I, also, one last thing on that, I'm not arguing that you should only do one or the other. In fact, the final viz of this had a line graph underneath it, so you click on a section and it shows you the trend for that section, name of that section. Uh, so you could use both, but I do, I'm a big believer in, in, in using schemas to your advantage. Third and final piece in the psychology section is I like to explicitly introduce the value of data visualization to my stakeholders. This is something I've struggled with my whole career. I'm sure a lot of you have been through the same thing, trying to kind of wane people off of Excel and get them to use something that's more visual and, and easier to use. And I'm gonna today share my exercise on how I do that. I just find that when you explicitly introduce the value of data viz, that it clicks with people when they actually see this example. So I wanna share it with you. Feel free to, to copy it if you'd like. But on this next slide, this is just a sample of data. It doesn't really matter what the data is, but it's showing the sales amounts per subcategory per month in the sample Superstore data set. And what I'd like for you to do, I might need some help up in this section. When I flip to the next slide, I wanna, I wanna try to answer the most basic business question possible, which is what is the highest number in this data set? That's all there is to it. If you shout out the right answer, you will win the admiration of all the people in the room. And please shout it so we can hear it. 11, a 15. I'm hearing some 15s, so I think some of you might have cheated. How about the lowest number? Is that one harder? Minus 45. I'm hearing 18, a zero. Anybody feeling really confident? Okay, I actually don't know what the answer is. I wouldn't waste my time with that, but <laughs> I'm gonna move to the next slide. <clears throat> and I'm gonna introduce a very, the most basic, really, pre-attentive attribute of color. Same data, it's gonna introduce color, you're gonna see the punchline right away. If I were to ask that same business question, you might have had to narrow it down to two, maybe three numbers, but you very quickly get in on 15, 864. Same thing on the low end, maybe there's four numbers that time, but within a couple seconds, you're gonna find 4561. <clears throat> and this is the value of data visualization. Um, and I even take this a step further. In tools like Tableau, you can add some extra code. If your business question really is, what's my highest number, what's my lowest number, you can put in a little bit of logic that just says, you know, color the highest number blue, the lowest number red. And then I personally take this a step further. This is where some people get a little squeamish. But for me, I don't personally need those exact numbers, depending on what my business question is. But I'm very comfortable with a view like this if that is the, the thing I'm trying to answer and just get straight to the point. So we went from trying to find the answer in this to trying to find the answer in this. And the reason I like this exercise, I like that there's a famous example from Stephen Few where you count the nines, but I like this one a little bit better because I'd say 80% of the corporate reports that I start with look like this. So when I say, hey, you can't even answer the most basic thing that we're trying to answer, uh, it, it clicks. Some people don't admit it, especially some C-level people. are like, oh, I've been looking at Excel for 30 years. I can, I can read that just as fast. You can't, but just got to move on. But I, th I do think for most people it clicks, and they start to get it. These are the benefits of data visualization as I see them. This is basically the benefit of what we just did, moving a spreadsheet to what's called a highlight table in Tableau. One is reduced time to insight. It was taking us a while, took us maybe 30 seconds to try to find the right answer earlier. Increased accuracy of insights. A lot of wrong answers. We were hearing conflicting uh, answers to that basic business question. And then thirdly is improved engagement. At least I argue that looking at a nice visual is more engaging than just the raw a wall of numbers would be, which then I argue leads to improved adoption, and then finally what I call the holy grail of data visualization, which is action. 
Tableau is very fun to use, but we're not getting paid just to have fun except for maybe this week. But yeah, at the end of the day, we need to create action with what we're looking at. And this has kind of become my mission statement. Everything I do in DataViz, if it doesn't meet all three of these, I don't do it. So one example, you know, I'm on team no pie chart, personally. And it's not because I'm a DataViz elitist or anything, it's because of this. It doesn't meet the three. Uh, reduce time to insight, no. We compare the length of bars much easier than we compare the areas of a chart or of a pie. Increase accuracy, increase accuracy of insights, same thing. We can't compare the areas within those slices as quickly as we can a bar chart, especially when it's sorted. And especially when you've got a, what I call a long tail uh, analysis, where if your pie has 50 slices in it, those long tail or smaller slivers are almost impossible to analyze. So it doesn't meet the first two, I don't do it. It's that simple. You might argue they're engaging, so it hit one out of three, but it didn't hit all three, so I, I wouldn't use a pie chart, if possible. Sometimes angry people make me do it, but. All right. The second piece in the Triple Crown framework is data. I'm not gonna spend as much time on this, because this, we all know this component. And I'm also kind of preaching to the choir here, and you probably know this, but I do want to share something very basic. It's gonna be review for a lot of you, but I like to share this because it's the single biggest barrier to adoption of Tableau that I see. And it's the shape of data in Tableau. And I'll, so I'll tell you my story, because I think a lot of people go through this. My first job was out, I'm from Kansas City, but I was out in San Francisco for a couple years and working at a very small market agency, five people worked there. And the boss walked in one day, there's three of us in the office, and she said, I've heard of this tool Tableau, can you guys take a shot at migrating our ex existing Excel reports to Tableau? Well, you open Tableau, the very first connector is Excel. Everybody's thinking, oh, this is great. It's gonna be easy, just hit Excel, connect to it. Opens in Tableau, everything's broken. Everybody thinks Tableau sucks. People, two out of three of us quit using Tableau. Uh, very fortunately, I stuck with it. The rest is history. I feel very, very happy I did that. But this is the reason that that happens, or people have that experience and kind of give up early. It's the shape of the data. Uh, your, your typical Excel report that you've had before Tableau might have looked something like this, where it's more of a horizontal structure. We've got our dates going left to right, KPIs going down the first column. You might even have subtotals, totals, other things that are problematic for Tableau. So I just like to share 90% of the time, you're gonna to wanna to reshape that data and transpose it so it's more in a vertical orientation. This, this isn't you know, the fact, a blanket statement for every situation, but I'd say 90% of the time, the data should look like the one in the bottom right there. There are other times where you wanna shape data with the end in mind. So this is a very extreme example. This, this is the 2015 visit of the year, and it looked at cost of attending the World Series a couple years ago when the, the Kansas City Royals were in is why I did it. But shaping data with the end in mind. I, I knew the end result I wanted, which were these, these polygon stadium maps, and to get that effect, I needed to put my data in a certain format for it to work well with Tableau. It's a very extreme example, but there's several others, things like a Sankey diagram, if you know what that is and want to do it, you'll save yourself a lot of trouble if you pre-shape the data before you start using Tableau. A uh, slightly easier example would be a funnel chart. I'll show you one example of that later on. Um, and then a unit chart. Those are just a few examples of where you might want to consider the shape of the data before you uh, use it in Tableau. All right, on the other end, this is something I usually talk about in my advanced section, but I'm gonna spend less time than usual when I, when I discuss this topic because we, we learned about hyper hyper yesterday, and these are probably all obsolete. But for the next three months or so, I got just a few things to consider. Think strategically about the data you need. I can't tell you how many times I get into a situation where I get to a client, they say, oh, this is going so slow, can't use it. And after doing some stakeholder interviews, figuring out what their business questions are, what we're gonna to try to make, we might come up with, oh, we're gonna make a year over year comparison report of some type. And I connect to the data, and first thing I see is it's got 10 years of data. We don't need eight of the 10 years of data. You just slice that off and you've considerably reduced the size of the data set. So it sounds kind of silly, but I do see this all the time and I'm gonna keep saying it until I stop seeing it. But yeah, just think strategically, do you actually need this before you use it in Tableau? Two is to prepare the data before it gets to Tableau. Big rule of thumb on this is I try to prepare as many of my dimensions as possible before they get to Tableau. So if you have a certain segment you're creating, try to do that logic before it gets to Tableau. With measures though, I very rarely aggregate those or prepare them before they get to Tableau. That would take away a lot of the flexibility of how you slice and dice the data. So yes, I try to prepare the data. That's a 
kind of blanket statement, but I'm talking specifically about dimensions, measures I would weight and, and aggregate those within Tableau. And the third and last one in this section is to use context filters. I feel like this is kind of an underknown about feature, but any filter can be what's called added to context. So if you've got a filter on your filter shelf, just click on it, there'll be an uh, option to add to context. And what that does is create a subset of the data so that every subsequent filter only hits that subset of data. And these process very efficiently. If this is of interest to you, please do research it. This is probably the most controversial tip I've got. Uh, some people argue to you know, use these you know, uh, in a limited fashion, but I've found a lot of success with using context filters, personally. All right, the third and final piece of the Triple Crown framework is design. And before we segue into this, this is the second of two interactive portions of this. And it's, I always enjoy this piece of it because I, I learn how people are using Tableau and why they're doing this, why are you in this room. So if, if a few of you are feeling comfortable, I'd really like to hear why do you visualize data? Why are you doing this? Anybody want to, I don't think, if anybody's near the mic, uh, that might help too. But if there's any in the front that could just shout, I'll repeat it too. Actual insights. Find actual insights? Okay. Have you seen me present before? This guy cheated his time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we've heard uh, she thinks of, of this as stories. It's a little bit easier to see it when there's a storytelling pattern. The first one I forgot to repeat was actual insights. I think I forgot to repeat it. How about one more? I only heard meetings, which doesn't sound right. What was it? Okay, outliers. How to find outliers. That has nothing to do with meetings. I've only been on my own since February. I'm stressed out, I guess, worrying about my meetings coming up next week. Uh, to find outliers. I think that's a great answer. So there wasn't really a right answer for sure, but I have thought about this a lot. And if I had to boil it down to one thing, my answer is to find and communicate actual insights. If I had to write one sentence, why are we doing this? That's the answer. The find and communicate piece, we've kind of covered, you know, with the highlight, moving from a spreadsheet or, or text table to that highlight table, we're able to find the insight faster. We'll get into a little bit more about how to communicate it in this design section. But also on the, on the actionable piece, I argue that in order to cause action, a lot of times you definitely need your insight to be seen by the most relevant audience possible. And depending on the situation, sometimes you need it to also be seen by the, the largest audience possible, especially if it's a mainstream setting like I often have in Tableau Public. And one way to do that is through design, that balance of the sizzle and the steak, the data and the design. So that's what this section is going to be about. I'm going to give you some tips that I hope are tangible and you can start using them right away. But my first tip is to balance data with design. And I'm going to show you the same viz twice. Once the final, I'm going to do the before and after. This is the before. I'd like to give you a little bit of context on this. It asks how long would it take you to earn as much as a major league baseball player? And then there's a parameter where you can type in your own salary and it spits out the answer. This one, I entered 135,000 in the box. The player was Mark Teixeira, and the statistic was home run. And it spits out the answer. So just to give you some context, the answer was Mark Teixeira made $7.7 .7 million per home run last season. At your current salary, it would take you 57 years to earn that. So it was an interesting topic. It's, I think, still my most shared viz on Twitter. People were typing in their salary, going to Twitter because they were depressed, telling the answer on how much they make, and it was very interesting to me. So I think it would have had some success, as is. But if I were to strip out all the design elements, I don't think it would have been as successful. So this is the kind of before. I did go the other direction. I started with the end and, and stripped out the design aspects of it. I, I frankly could have made this even worse. It still has a nice vertical layout. Things are spaced well. But everything else is default. Default fonts, default colors, uh, no icons. Uh, you get the idea and to show you the, the before again. I think that this is gonna be mu much more shareable than something that looks like this. Same answer, but something like this is gonna be much more shareable. And often when I discuss this topic, I hear the argument that, well, I'm a data person and I get it. It's kind of two sides of your brain, but they think they can't do this. And I just, I don't buy it, I really don't. I, I've, I've never been trained in design. I kind of did it in college as a hobby. I've gotten a little bit better. I'm definitely not a graphic designer by any means. 
But I, because of that, the feeling that people can't do it, I wanted to share just a couple of tangible things I think you could do right away. So the first is with fonts. There, there's no reason you can't take two extra minutes and just play around with some fonts. Maybe your brand has a specific font that they like to use. Find something that's unique to you. Find your own niche. Make sure it's legible. That's the most important thing. But that's just an easy way to make your own, kind of carve out your own space and make your, your design unique. Color is another very easy one. Color is, you know, it's uh, at the forefront of everything you see, and it's very easy to play around with the colors. But one tangible tip is I like to, what I call mute the colors. I don't know if that's the proper term for it. The science behind what you're doing is reducing the saturation of the color. To give you an example, this would be at full saturation. It's, it's kind of vibrant in your face, kind of hard to look at. It's not very easy on the eye. And then this is a little bit more doled down. I call it muted. There's an easy way to do that. You click on the color marks card and just drag that opacity slider over to the left. I usually do 80 to 90%, somewhere in there. It just takes off the kind of sheen and, and brashness of the color. And the last thing, these icons, this is the one thing in this viz that required any design experience. And it's just a set of icons that I bought from iStockphoto.com for $12. I did open this in, in Illustrator to change the color of the icons so it matched the bars, but that's it. There's no reason anybody can't buy these icons. There's another site I like to use called thenounproject.com. You can buy them, buy the images royalty free for $2 each. So those will often make it into my visualizations as well as my blog and content marketing. And it's very easy to do. Anybody can, can download those uh, icons. The next section in the design pillar is to keep things simple. I'm a big believer that less is more. This, this one, I'll give you a little bit of context on this one as well. It asks one question, which is a theme in my visits. I try to keep it very focused. But this one asks, what are the odds of going pro in sports? This is another one that I think it would have been, had some success. I still get search engine visits to this viz because it's high school parents are searching for this topic, trying to figure out if their kid's gonna make them rich and be their retirement plan. So I think it would have had some success, but this was my most popular, most viewed viz for a long time until that viz of the year with the stadiums. And I credit its success and popularity with its simplicity. This one is almost impossible not to understand. There's one question, then there's two different filters and they're self-explanatory. You choose male or female, you choose among four different sports, and then the one chart updates to answer the question. And if you need the exact numbers, they're there in the boxes. This is an example of one that would pass my mom test, where it's just impossible not to understand the topic. Um, and I, I think this is very applicable in a corporate setting. Uh, to keep it less is more, by keeping it focused, people will actually know the purpose of what they're looking at, and then it, it just kind of naturally leads to finding the insight and doing something about it. And I share this because I often find people are trying to do too much in their corporate dashboards. Uh, this might be, I'm kind of an outlier maybe on how people view dashboards. I'm not one that wants to look at 30 things at one time. I think that's counterproductive. Instead, I try to be strategic and know what my business question is, and then everything else should ladder up to answering that question very, very easily. And it needs to be easy for people to understand. The third and final tip in this section, it's kind of a little quick intro to storytelling, but I encourage you to add your own narrative to an old story. And it's kind of related to the text table versus highlight table. I love to share this example because I'm a big sports fan and every time I go look to see how my team's doing in any sport, whether it's NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, this one happens to be Major League Soccer, which is even worse because uh, in European football, they affectionately refer to this as the table. And as a, as a data viz evangelist, it just, it pains me when I try to go figure out how my team's doing and I have to, I'm subjected to this. This is very inefficient for me to find. I know there's a better way. And so what I've done is I've taken a shot at taking the table and making it more visual and easy to understand, kind of practice what I preach. And it's, the tip is to add your own narrative to an old story because this is related to storytelling. And I, this is a kind of interesting topic that's been on my mind. I kind of feel like storytelling is starting to become a bit of a buzzword. Mainly, I don't like that usually people talk about it, but they don't give you tangible ways to do something with it. They just say, tell a better story. Like, look, what does that mean? And then, what am I supposed to do with that? So I took a shot at that, but even though it's becoming a bit of a buzzword, I've researched this, and, and there's definitely some undeniable parallels between data visualization and storytelling. The three in particular, what I did, what I found in my research was that 
every story has three elements or ingredients to it. It has, it has characters, a plot or storylines, if you want to think about it like that, and a narrative. And how I equate those three things to the practice of data visualization is the characters are the KPIs or the dimensions and the measures in your data visualization. The insights that you find or that emerge can be thought of as the plot or the storylines. And then I think of the narrative as the style in which you're communicating that insight once it emerges. And that's the piece we really have a lot of control over. So here's just one example of, of many that I attempt to do. But I took this table. I won't bore you because I know not everybody's a soccer fan. But one of my objectives was to use the same amount of space and provide just, I can't tell you how many more insights are, are in this. First, you make your, I make my end user part of the story because they choose their own team Then the rest of the Viz updates. It gives you the main answer on the left there on how they're doing, their win-loss tie record. But then from there, the comparisons, you just, again, I don't want to bore you with the stats, but I, I promise you there are just so many more insights that I'm able to glean from this in about 10 seconds versus it would just take me several minutes to even come close to figuring out those same answers in this view. All right, and to tie this all together before I get to the tactical portion of the presentation, I, wanna, I like to share this. Again, it's another one that is feeling old to me, but this was my Iron Viz winning Viz. So this was 2013. It gets better every year. Both the contestants get better in quality, and Tableau, the tool itself, gets better. So there's more features and different ways to use it. But this was my winning Viz. It asks one question, do old movies get better with age? And Part of why I think it won is this, the insight that I found was extremely compelling. So just to tell you what happened here, if you look at the line graph in the middle, the y-axis is average movie rating, and the x-axis is age of the movie. And there's a pretty clear correlation. As a movie's older, it's perceived to be better. You remember things better than they were. And that's I think, was a very intriguing story to tell. But the reason I'm sharing it in this context is I want to just kind of show you I practice what I preach, so I'm going to go top to bottom and just talk about the three pillars we talked about. So starting with psychology, I, I attempted to leverage schemas. I didn't know it at the time, what I was doing, but the gold and, and gray penciled in star, those represented both my color legend and also, and also the way to explain what was what. So you could quickly compare a new movie versus an old movie. You might notice there's no actual color legend but you, you know which is which. Because that's because of the schema. You just associate that gold star, and it, it's got the nice, sharp design to it. It feels very modern and new. Then you got the gray sketched out, penciled star. Everybody knew that that represented the old movies for the rest of the Viz. That was leveraging a schema. On the data side, the Viz asked one question, do old movies get better with age? But my data set uh, had one very big gap, and that was age of the movie. That actually wasn't a measure in my visual in the data set I was using. But fortunately, there was a dimension called movie title. And in parentheses, they're all done in the same format. In parentheses, it had the year of movie release. So I was able to do a calculated field that stripped out the four-year uh, movie year of release, then a second calculated field that took the year we were in, 2013, minus the year of release to create that data set. Kind of an extreme example. That was doing some data prep within Tableau, but definitely related to data and shaping my data with the end in mind, which we discussed earlier. Then finally, the design. One thing I love to share every time I show the winning viz is, again, this is Tableau's kind of Super Bowl. It's their main contest. The three finalists are always very, very good. And I just want to point out how simple this is. It asks one question. It has technically three chart types, really two visuals, but we'll call it three chart types. It has what I call a call-out number at the top where you get the answer right away. 7.6 was the average movie rating for new movies. 8.18 was the average for old. It has a line graph and bar charts. This is the winning viz in Tableau's biggest contest, and it's got nothing sophisticated to it whatsoever, at least visually and design-wise. We can all do this stuff. So I really hope you take that to heart. I'm kind of a big believer that line graphs and bar charts tend to follow the 80-20 rule, where I, I kind of believe that about 80% of business questions can be answered with just those chart types alone. All right, I'm going to hop over and show you quickly how to make this chart type. This viz, let me see if Tableau it's not Tableau's fault, but let's see if my resolution cooperates to jump over here. Thanks. Keep changes. All right. So what this viz looks at 
are the margins of victory in the Super Bowl. I love to share the backstory on this because I was making it during the last Super Bowl. I know we're getting a little bit away from it, but I'm a huge football fan. But this was the last Super Bowl that we had in February. And I was watching the Patriots and Falcons. Falcons were up, I think it was 28 to three. And I was, frankly, I was pretty bored. And I was like, I'm gonna make a tableau viz about this. And I was just interested on what the biggest margins of victory were. Well, if you know football, Patriots started to come back. I could kind of see my, my fame and fortune dwindling away because I knew this wouldn't be as interesting anymore. But I was committed, so I finished making it. All right, but what I'm gonna show you how to make is this chart that some people refer to it as a DNA chart, some people refer to it as a dumbbell chart. Uh, you might, so I have this normalization toggle. I've got a blog post on this, I'm not gonna show you today, but it might be easier for you to understand what we're gonna build if I show it to you this way. So this would be a traditional dumbbell chart. Some people consider this not quite best practice. I, I will use this if I'm comparing exactly two data points. I think it's very engaging, and I don't think it does any harm to connect the dots like this. And that's what I'm gonna show you how to make. So I'm gonna start with just making a traditional bar chart that looks at game ID and score. So what this would be is the total score per Super Bowl. We've had 51 of them. To break this down to know which team won, AFC versus NFC, I'm gonna drag AFC and NFC to color. There's only two leagues. So it, and what it does at this point is stack my bars on top of each other. That I almost never do. I don't, I'm not a fan of a stack bars. So the first thing I would do here is change the mark type from automatic, which is bar, to circle, which will separate the circles. Now I can see per year is the blue dot higher than the red dot or the red dot higher than the blue dot. See which team, which uh, league won the Super Bowl that year. Could hover over it to get their score. But from here, I'm gonna make a second row with the same measure. This is my favorite shortcut in all Tableau. If you hold the control key on a PC anyway, and click on any field on a view, it creates an exact duplicate of that pill. So now I've got the same thing on two rows. For the second row, I'm going to change the mark type from circle to line. So at this point, we have what's called a dot plot on the top, score per league, <coughs> excuse me, uh, per Super Bowl. On the bottom, we basically have a trend over time for each league. But what I'm gonna do now that I've changed this to a line graph is this is a shortcut if you're creating this chart type. Some people have ways that take way too long to do this, but all you need to know how to do is take the dimension that you're slicing those lines by, and instead of doing it by color, you just move this to path. And you'll immediately see the, the nice sharp lines kinda, you're seeing it come together. The last thing you do is make it a dual axis. Some people like to click on the second pill and click dual axis. I'll show you one other shortcut you might not know about that'll save you one click. If you hover over the second row, there's a little green triangle that appears, and I can left click on that and drag it to the other side. And a couple last little things to format it. I especially would wanna synchronize the axes by right clicking, click synchronize axis. And you probably can't see it back there, but I'll fix it anyway. My gray lines are laying on top of my blue and red circles currently but I can easily move the marks to the back by right clicking on the axis and click move marks to back. That puts the gray lines behind those circles. I might make the circles a little bit bigger and we've got ourselves a nice looking engaging chart in just about two minutes. I think that is much more effective than especially a table but even a bar chart or other choices. And I do have a tutorial on that as well if you're very interested. I hate for people to have to take notes or anything while we're here. All right, hold our breath one more time. All right, I got it. I'm gonna leave you with just a couple of resources. We made great time, so I'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions, but the two resources I wanna leave you with, again, my website, ryansleeper.com. I do a weekly tutorial. I have an email list. I take data privacy extremely seriously, so if you subscribe, I won't spam you but you will get a tutorial every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time. Hell or high water, that thing will be in your inbox every week. And then the second resource is Practical Tableau. This, again, as a reminder, is already available in what's called early release. It's not in print yet, and people get very confused about that, but you can go to Safari Books Online and read 71 out of the 100 chapters. And I've made a, a, a shorter URL to get straight to it, just practicaltableau.com. And before I open it up for Q&A, 
I just want to provide a, a reminder, I'm legally required to do this. Uh, please complete the session survey from the session details screen in your T T TC17 app. A little confusing, I share the Triple Crown framework, but this is called Tableau Prints. You can likely search for either Strategy or Ryan Sleeper, and you'll find the session title. And that's all I have. So thank you for the time, and definitely I'm happy to stick around for about 15 minutes and answer some questions if you've got them. Thank you. Oh, and the mic is right there. If you've got a question, that's probably the easiest way. Should have mentioned that. I do have a question. Okay. A lot of my end users want to get detail within the same dashboard or very quickly. Do you have a best practice for kind of drilling in to the line item details? Yeah, I've got a few ways. As we all saw yesterday in the keynote, Viz and Tooltip is going to help a lot with that, but that's another one that's not quite out. What I do currently, I do it in several ways. Either hierarchies, you could create a custom hierarchy and drill down within one view. There's a little bit more elegant solution where you can actually show two different chart types and use a parameter that a parameter control to choose which chart you show. That's on my site as well, that approach to doing it. It'll walk you step by step how to do that. Uh, but you could choose basically between, I've, the example that I've got is a highlight table and a map. And there's a parameter you can just flip between the two. The third way I might do it is create a dashboard action with a URL action that navigates to a deeper tab about whatever that chart is showing. Those are the three main ways I do it. Hi. Uh, thanks again for coming. Uh, I love your visits. I'm a huge sports fan, uh, so I really enjoy following those. But I just have a, a small question. So I've been able to build charts like you just showed with the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. but I've always uh, dragged that second uh, sum of whatever it is, the second measure to line instead of path. What, okay. what, can you explain the difference between doing the two? I guess is um, the path what gives you the lines in the middle of the biz instead of starting at the bottom? So you would at least have to put the same measure on the row shelf twice, right? Yeah. Or are you going straight to the dual axis? Um, put it on there twice and then yeah. dual axis, then okay. the sync axis. Yeah, when it's a line, it's basically telling it how to connect the dots. When you put it on color, it's connecting its default behavior, at least in the example I just showed, is to connect the dots for the, each league across years. When you move it to path, it just changes the direction to connect the dots between AFC and NFC for each Super Bowl. Okay. So it just is basically the order of how it's going to connect the dots. Okay, cool. Thanks. There are other ways to, that's a very common theme. I talk about that all the time. There's always more than one way to do things in Tableau. That's the easiest I've found to make that chart. Thanks. Yep. Hi. I was just wondering uh, what design style type thing would get the most gasps over time? Have you noticed anything that just always gets a, a reaction from an Like a viz thing? type? Yeah. Yeah, the polygon maps, the custom polygon maps, which is uh, both stadium examples that I had to share today. I've got one other example that looks at the concussions, the source of concussions by body part in the NFL. So it has a map of a football player, and then it, it's, uh, it traces the shape of that player, and I can color the head by one thing. It's actually colored on intensity of source of the concussion. And those are, yeah, those always have the most wow factor. In fact, last year, if you want to look it up, there was a, the, I, the session I presented was called How to Map Anything in Tableau, and we, I show you how to make polygon maps. Of course, there's a chapter in the book and a blog post to get to it quicker. But that probably gets the most wow, and it's actually not that hard to do. You can do it just with Excel and Tableau in, a, in just a couple hours. Yep. I just had a question. I liked your learning curve. And can you describe a little bit more what happened in that tipping point from when it was flat to all of a sudden your learning took off? And yeah. any advice for replicating that? Sure. That was kind of an extreme example of my curve. It's probably more like this, to be honest, flat and then slowly, including right now. Everybody's always learning. You never completely master Tableau. But I would say where it started to at least go in the right direction, really, I, I can't, I've actually got this question quite a few times. It's, I don't have a like aha moment where I'm like, oh, this all makes sense. But what happens is you, you solve a problem you know, one at a time, and every time you solve one, you kind of can add it to your tool belt. And what happens over time, I found, is you can start to make new connections and invent new ways of doing it. And it just takes time to 
it just handling real life situations, finding your own ways to solve them. Uh, that was my personal journey, which probably could look a lot different today. You know, eight years ago, there was one book on Tableau. It was about 50 pages long. It was much harder to learn Tableau. So everybody else's journey will probably look a lot different. There's just so many good resources. Um, the one I guess I would advocate for more than any other is Tableau Public. I credit most of my success with Tableau Public. If you don't know what that is, it's a free tool. What I love about it is it, you have to save it to the web so you can't use it at work and it makes you try new things and work with data that is you know, outside of your day job. And inevitably, so my topic was sports, but it could be anything. And Inevitably, if you find a topic you're passionate about and just practice with Tableau Public, you'll learn new things that you can then take back to your day job. So that'd be my one big tip to try to replicate that. Hi, thanks for your presentation today. My question is around, I noticed in a lot of your examples, uh, instead of using titles, you use questions. And I mm -hmm. took a note last year at the conference, um, somebody presented and it made a lot of sense to me. But then when I went back to my organization, it was really difficult to come up with those questions because mm -hmm. we're not having just one you know, simple mm -hmm. diagram. It's more several key KPIs for the organization. So could you talk a little bit about how we can incorporate questions versus titles? Yes, it, it goes back to strategy. So it, the first thing I would do is try to kind of regroup and know what, I always try to zero in on what are the business questions and then how am I gonna answer those business questions. And if you really take that process to heart, they should be kind of emerge, and you won't have to have 50 things. You'll have two or three business questions, and then maybe two or three ways to answer each one. That's the first thing I would do, but if you can't quite get there yet, and you're wanting to visualize everything on a dashboard in one page, what you potentially could do as an alternative is have kind of sub-questions within a dashboard. So if it's, you know, sales dashboard is the title of it, within each of the, underneath that sales dashboard title, you could have several questions that try to just tell you what's going on in the business. That still requires some strategy though, to think about what are the questions. I am big on that, because it, it, if you don't have a question, how do you even know what you're looking at? So I'm huge on that. I try to steer companies into, you know, not, this isn't just, you know, we, we wanna track the sales number. Yeah, but what do you wanna do with that? Like why? That, and that always leads to what is the question? And then it just will naturally give you other ways to look at it, I think. Yeah, so going back to your stadium, stadium polygons, I was just curious, how do you get like the data for the get-in price? Because I did something similar for the MLS All-Stars versus Real Madrid back in Soldier Field in Chicago. So I was just really curious, do you use like primary data, primary data from Ticketmaster or do you use like secondary data from like StubHub's open API? Which oh is yeah, how I got it. It, it's always secondary for me. Okay. And they've actually changed that. It's, some, it's actually a funny story. I don't know if he's in the room or not, but somebody got in trouble for using the StubHub API. Really? I won't share who it was, but they kind of, you can't do it as, as well anymore. But there are some other screen scraping type tools that work okay, that are free, like import.io is one I've used. Uh, sometimes I'll use a Google Sheet that'll point to somewhere and I use an import function to go grab the table of data and put it in a Google Sheet. Okay. Then I connect Tableau Public to that. So there are ways to get to it or just old fashioned elbow grease and recording them. I mean, I, I do that a lot. People are like, oh, that's amazing, and they don't know the behind the scenes isn't that glamorous all the time. Yeah. You know, it, it's 14 days of data. If I had to go record that by 10 sections, that's not a big deal. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? It, you don't have to do the craziest thing possible all the time. But there's definitely other alternatives other than um, the StubHub API. But all of mine have been secondary data sources, yeah. Cool. So just, just one more question. So like, how do you gain insight from like tracking the get-in price? Like, how does that help? Because I mean, I gained, I, that was probably the most insight I've ever gained from this personally. Uh, I didn't show you the full one, but what I learned as a big sports fan is if you want to go to a big event, you, you hold off until the day before. Until the day of? Yeah. The day before. If, oh, yeah. if what, that's what it showed. I didn't know that. It will kind of steadily increase or be very high. But if you don't get squeamish and think, oh, the price is going to keep going up and buy it, if you can wait till the day before, it drops because yeah. it's like a game of chicken. The sellers get afraid they're not going to sell them. The price drops. But if you wait until the day of, it jumps way back up. And my theory is they then delist them. They take them off the website, I think. Yep. So what's left is higher price. So that was one insight I got from that. So that's awesome. what I do now. All right, thank you. Yep. 
Hi, Ryan. Thanks for the um, great presentation today. Um, in your business experience, um, I work in the human resources um, function, so most of my visits function around show us the data, but then we want a list of people. In your experience, um, do you have other areas um, that are like that, and are, are they more challenging to work with, in your opinion, than other areas? As in you need to show the high-level number but then drill down to the person to, level? Correct. So basically, if we're showing like our performance dashboard and they want to know, hey, what are our, our low performers for the last two years, mm -hmm. they want to see that visually but then get down to the people. Sure. It's very similar. I think it was the first question, possibly the second, but same approach to providing that drill down. One thing I didn't really talk about with the audience is, is sometimes there's definitely overlap. So this could be an example where the C-level view is going to be the highest level, but then I will most likely in incorporate some type of user experience that also lets you drill down to deeper layers. And it's the approaches I already shared as far as either a hierarchy, Viz and Tooltip will be very handy for that because you'll be able to do a scatter plot, hover over your number, and it'll show a scatter plot of everybody, that type of thing or a bar chart of worst performer, top performer. That, that's going to be great. But in the meantime, you can just navigate to a deeper layer using uh, dashboard URL actions is what I would do. Thank you. Yep. All right. I think that's everybody. I'm happy to hang out. We're perfectly on time. We've got three minutes. I've got cards up here, too, if you want to meet. But thanks, everybody. Hopefully, see you around.